We have almost 45 minutes for questions, so we should be able to get to everyone, but please, uh, when it's your turn, just ask one question at a time, if you would. That way we can get to other people's questions and then we can always come back to you at some point if you have a second question, but we'd ask you to just start with one question at a time. And if you have a specific person that you're asking the question to, you can direct it to a specific person, or otherwise you can just ask the general question. So, go ahead. Um, someone in the front? Nothing's been said today yet about stem cell therapy. Could somebody please comment on where that stands? I guess. So we weren't talking about treatment in this session. Really, just getting the basic framework for what pulmonary fibrosis is and the symptoms that go along with it, and how do we get to an accurate diagnosis. I actually don't know if someone is or is not speaking on stem cell therapy during the conference, but it's certainly in the experimental phases right now for IPF and other fibrotic lung diseases. And I would just comment, too, that uh, the, the foundation just recently updated a statement on uh, the treatment of, of stem cell, um, and I, I would recommend that you read that. I think it's very well done, and I think, as, as Joy said, it's in a very highly experimental stage right now. I think. Obviously, some, you know, some of the concerns are is that you can almost go to a strip mall and pay uh, money for stem cell treatment, and that's probably, that's probably different than the experimental trials that we're talking about in, a, in an academic center. Absolutely, and I think this um, goes back to stuff that Wendy was talking about. There are a lot of people out there trying to catch the attention of a lot of our patients and purporting effects, um, not because there's actually any data to support it, but just because they um, want to make money, quite frankly. And so the stem cell stuff is being studied very scientifically, and so that's different than these strip mall places that are trying to sell stem cell therapies for just about everything. I'm assuming CFS will be carrying updates on that from time to time? Yes. Again, we just recently probably updated that in the last six months, and we had had a, a response probably about four years ago. So mm -hmm. as, as things improve and change, we will definitely keep that updated. Question sure. for Wendy. I uh, have done a, a pulmonary rehab course, and in connection with it, I used both their constant flow tank and my, uh, my concentrator, my, one of the larger concentrators. I'm not mentioning any names. It goes, went to a pulse of five or six. And with, with the, uh, uh, the oxygen tank on about pulse three, and with the concentrator on about f five or six, I had about the same results with checking it out with the oximeter. Uh, similarly, I've tried the same thing at night when I've been sleeping. Uh, it's, it's, of course, it's been a large concentrator uh, for the, con for the uh, constant flow, and it's been a smaller one, but set on five or six uh, f uh, for the, not the constant flow, whichever you call the other, the, the, the intermediate. And so I've had reasonably good success with them. Can you address that? I'm not sure what the question was. So you, you're using a where lot does, of- Where does that fit into your being cautious about concentrators that you suggested? My, my cautiousness with um, POCs is that they, they deliver this pulse therapy like you were talking about. Five liters pulse therapy is not the same as five liters continuous. When we walk you in the hallway um, to do a six minute walk to kind of judge how much oxygen you're gonna need when you walk to hold your oxygen levels in the 90s, at Vanderbilt I'm walking you on a continuous delivery. So when I write an order for five liters continuous delivery, that does not translate to five liters pulse delivery, okay? It's, it's very much less. And for most patients with pulmonary fibrosis, when you get past about four liters, and I believe there's a paper out right now um, looking at this very thing, but when you get about um, past four liters needing for exertion, the POCs at that pulse to delivery typically won't cover you. It typically won't keep you in the 90s. And you know, every day I'm in clinic, I hear, well, I'll just slow down and my numbers will come back up. I don't want you to slow down. I don't want you to have your oxygen saturations doing this all day. 
the goal is to keep your oxygen in the 90s as best I can. The pulse delivery um, systems are very, um, you know, much easier to use, but, but really you should go ahead and move forward with the, um, the e-cylinders and get a continuous flow. I agree. Yes. And I would, I would add to that that what often happens is patients will say, well, um, I feel okay on pulse delivery, right? Um, but often you've learned to live at a lower oxygen for quite some time. And so feeling okay may not actually equate to your oxygen levels being okay, which is why that pulse oximeter becomes really helpful to understand the dynamic process of your oxygen requirements changing. The other thing is um, to avoid limiting your exercise because your oxygen levels, you, to, to, in line with what your oxygen needs are, right? So what we don't want you to do is say, well, I can walk two blocks if I use pulse, but I can walk four blocks. Walking four blocks requires that I take out the tank. So I'm just gonna do the two. No, because that ends up, what ends up happening is then you're losing um, the strength and the mobility that you've worked hard to gain because you're limiting your activity for your oxygen. And that's not the order in which we want you to do it. We want you to use the oxygen you need to be able to do the activity that you can do. Got someone over here? Question about the oxygen. Uh, the question about oxygen use and when it's ordered is it ordered when the patient becomes dyspneic a lot of the time or when they become hypoxemic? So remember we talked about the differences between dyspnea and, and hypoxia. Medicare pays for oxygen when you hit that hypoxia or hypoxemia. So your pulse ox needs to show that your oxygen sats are dropping. So it's not always a dyspnea thing. All right, it's always a hypoxia thing. And uh, there, is a, there are two oxygen sessions. It's the same session, but it was so popular last year that we didn't have room to fit everyone. So it's tomorrow and Saturday you can go to the oxygen session. There will be actually someone there to show some of the equipment, as well as Susan Jacobs from Stanford who has just an amazing wealth of knowledge about oxygen. So, I mean, feel free to ask questions about oxygen, that's fine, but also you can get a lot of information at that oxygen session tomorrow or Saturday. I'm sorry, still on oxygen. <laughs> the uh, question is, when, when, we go to, when we go to Colorado, we're living in, in Austin, San Antonio, Texas, uh, oxygen saturation is in the 90s, 95% is good, 96. Go up to Eagle, to Edwards Vale, spend a week up there. Uh, drops into the high 80s. Yeah. Other than the fact that it's slowing us down, tell me about the long-term effects, physiologically, of being short on oxygen. Well, we see that, unfortunately, quite a bit in, in my patient population in Denver. So going from 5,200 feet to you know, 9,000 or 10,000 feet certainly impacts how you feel. So first and foremost, patients feel more short of breath at higher altitude. The other things that we worry about with low oxygen levels in that um, environment is the stress on your heart. So when your oxygen levels are low as you measure them on the pulse oximeter, the pulmonary system is designed in a way to try and increase the oxygen delivery. So there is a physiologic response to have what's called pulmonary hypertension. And that's probably the most worrisome physiologic consequence of going to altitude and not having your oxygen needs met is the development of pulmonary hypertension and strain on the right side of your heart, which can lead to fluid backing up and worsening shortness of breath because of that you know, normal physiologic response to low oxygen levels. Yeah. Back here? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to hear more uh, about uh, GERD as a causal effect, more detail. Another area of your I know Dr. Ragu has done uh, a lot of studies on it. But, yeah, uh, y'all are asking some good questions. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Um, so reflux 
in IPF and ILD has been studied for a long time, and you're right, Dr. Ragu um, initially brought attention to this relationship um, many, many years ago. So what we know about reflux in IPF in particular is that it's common. So most of the patients who have IPF have some form of reflux. Not all patients, though, have the classic symptoms of heartburn, regurgitation, or acid burning sensation um, in IPF, and we don't know exactly why they don't have the classic symptoms, but we do know that it's present, but patients may not have symptoms from it. There are what we call circumstantial data looking at the role of medical treatment or surgical treatment for acid reflux in patient populations, and there are mixed data in this regard, so some studies show a beneficial effect to treating the acid reflux with proton pump inhibitors, others show less of an effect. Um, there was one uh, randomized control trial looking at Nissen fundoplication, so the surgical correction for acid reflux in patients with IPF, and um, it was a phase two clinical trial and um, had um, some suggestion of efficacy but not complete. And so, um, and, and then the larger question of cause and effect, I think, remains entirely unknown. But we do know that reflux may lead to progression of the IPF, whether it's through aspiration of stomach contents because of the reflux that's occurring, but that's all um, in the hypothetical world right now in terms of causation. Yep. Just to say, what? On a genetic diagnosis, can IPF be determined to be genetic? And uh, I watched the PFF seminar last week, and it just lit me up. I mean, it was so informative, so I encourage everybody to plug into that. They talked about GERD, and they said that at, if you have a cough at the clavicle, clavicle, it's very likely to GERD. Well, my dad had IPF in 93, and upon diagnosis, died two years. I was diagnosed two years ago, still going, okay. And my younger brother was diagnosed, so I'm, I'm very intrigued about genetics versus GERD. I think it's actually probably a combination of many different factors. I think what we are understanding about this complex group of diseases is that for many patients, there's likely some genetic predisposition, but genetic predisposition alone um, is insufficient to cause disease, we think, in most circumstances. And it's really the gene by environment interaction. That environmental trigger, you know, in theory, we could hypothesize could be GERD, it could be smoking, it could be a bird in the home. So all of these different things, your underlying gene makeup plus something else in your environment and how they interact is probably, you know, the initiating steps. But, the, you know, we don't know exactly what precisely um, those initiating triggers are at this time. And tomorrow from 325 to 5 p.m., there's a whole session on familial PF and genetic counseling so that they can get more into the background and more in depth on that question. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, we live in a house with two parrots, and, um, but my husband has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, also has reflux. So um, is, you know, how would we find out if the birds are actually the cause, or doesn't it matter? Uh, we've been told we don't have to get rid of them now, but it would be essential once he has a transplant. So I just want your thoughts on, or get guidance really on what to do. Is it Erica, I wanna? Sure. The... <laughs> Again, I think these are complicated discussions, and um, you know, we do our best with the information we have to make a diagnosis and, um, and make management decisions that flow from that. But certainly when we're thinking about all of the potential triggers for lung disease exposures and birds in particular, one that we think a lot about. Now there are a lot of patients that have birds and have down pillows or have mold and don't get lung disease, right? Um, but we do get really um, concerned about it in patients where those exposures are present and they do have lung disease. Um, I think part of it is around the certainty of that diagnosis, the extent to which that's been evaluated and what that diagnosis has been, 
made on. In general, I think um, if I'm concerned that there is a big exposure in my home, my general recommendation is to remove that exposure. Oh, up here, up front. Mm -hmm. uh, inflammation was mentioned. And I'm really curious to know how you would go about tracking down inflammation. And if somebody has elevated inflammation, how do you, how do you track down whether it's a cause or an effect of IPF? Um, so inflammation, um, lots of patients have evidence of inflammation, right? Well, lots of patients will come with evidence of joint disease. Um, Patients may have um, an underlying autoimmune disease, and we don't see evidence of it involving their lungs, or, or it may be involved in their lungs. So I think this really speaks to the, um, the complexity of making these diagnoses, that there may be multiple factors that were um, exposures or medical history that could be relevant, and sometimes it's a really clear pattern. You know, the puzzle pieces come together really easily, and sometimes it's a little murkier. Mur um, murkier. There are patients that have joint disease or have um, serologic tests that show inflammation, and we have to figure out what we do with that. So it's really in close consultation with your providers in the context of this multidisciplinary conference and getting all those different pieces that we kind of decide what we think, those, how those pieces best fit together. Um, so I, meaning, uh, a rise in inflammation meaning the serologic tests, or? Uh, an increase in serologic protein, for instance, and see if I can pull myself up slightly, and see if that be the root cause of inflammation in the body. We, we, don't, we generally think of IPF as a, diag a disease that causes progressive scarring and that it's not generally an inflammatory condition. I will say patients, often we get inflammatory markers that are elevated um, as we age, and they may or may not be related to the disease. Over here. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so I'm a pediatric dentist. And every day, every morning, I aerosolize necrotic dental tissue uh, into the air into a nice dental powdery mist day in and day out. From where you sit, which professions concern you, what are on your radar when it comes to PFF? I mean, certainly those occupations that you describe, um, people who are in the shipyard workers who are exposed to asbestos, construction, sandblasting, um, metal grinding, metal grinding uh, people who weld, um, coal workers. Yep, there's a, the list of ocu potential occupational exposures is very um, vast and trying to figure out how much exposure is necessary to be causative in the disease is always a challenge. But, you know, telling your doctor um, all the occupations that you've had in the past. I mean, we talk about, you know, farming when they're teenagers and what they did on the farm uh, back when they were 18 years old to what they were doing just last week. Um, so I think it's important to as best as you can, um, tell your provider the, the types of exposures that you've had over time. Uh, <clears throat> just to follow up, you're a dentist, correct? Yeah. Um, I recall a study that was done, published a few months, maybe a year ago. Yes, okay. uh, I think Dr. Steve Nathan, Steve Nathan right. Mm -hmm. And they, there's a pattern, a cluster of dentists who've been identified with pulmonary fibrosis. And it was very preliminary, I think. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was there as a, you know, statistically. Yep. So um, you, might, you might find that study. Uh, Dr. Stephen Nathan is at uh, Inova Fairfax, if you want to follow up with him. And he's here. Jeez. He's at the conference. He's here. Oh, yeah. he's here. Yeah. <laughs> over here? Yes, uh, there was an indication of uh, a concern with too much radiation in, in terms of the testing. Uh, 
my example would be when I uh, was diagnosed, uh, I think I was on a, a three-month uh, pattern of uh, CT scans, and now we've expanded those to six months and, and doing the pulmonary function tests in the, an alternate uh, uh, three-month uh, period uh, so that uh, each of those are, are six months apart. Uh, I wonder if that still is considered uh, too much uh, of uh, radiation for the CT scans. Uh, I don't personally do that in my practice. I, I don't, um, outside of the baseline CT scan, um, the times that I get a repeat CT scan are um, either one year after starting treatment um, or if the patient has a clinical deterioration. But I really refrain from um, serial scheduled uh, CT scans because we know that can be um, harmful over time. Be, you know, so you really are concerned about that because I, if I may, when I, when I see the results off of those, they're very specific and my uh, pulmonologist is able to really pull them up and show me and, and indicate where there's been deterioration. I, I come from a very technical background in my yeah. uh, career, and, and so the, the specifics of that, they, they seem to be so much better than the pulmonary function test, which I, I, I've had one where I, I, I did much better, and I, I just felt I learned how to, how to do them uh, yeah. better. So I, I yeah. just didn't, I really didn't believe that I was uh, better because yeah. the, the radiology test showed that there was uh, still, you know, some uh, further uh, disease taking place. But you, you're just, you think that the concerns overwhelm the uh, ability to diagnose. I think that um, there are no standards, there are no guidelines on frequency of CT scan imaging in our patient population. I mean, we can ask how Wendy does it in her practice or Dr. Ferrand, uh, but um, I do worry about cumulative radiation exposure over time. I, I would wonder if they're watching something else. You know, for you to be getting serial scans, I mean, that's the first thing I would think of. Is there, is there a lymph node or something your doctor's watching? Yeah. Um, and the, the thing I, tr I talk to patients about is this is really a picture. It's just a picture. The better thing that's going to tell me how you're doing is you telling me how you're doing. Um, the pulmonary function tests tell me how well your lungs are working and that walk in the hallway. Those are the three things that I count on that's really going to tell me how your breathing is and how your IPF is not necessarily a picture, unless, like Dr. Lee said, unless you're showing me some changes um, in, in your cough or some new symptom that would lead me down the road to do diagnosis. I, I wouldn't say necessarily what your doctor's doing is wrong, no. Yeah. But, but with less risk, I think, is what they're saying. I mean, you think about even, like an example of a surgical lung biopsy, you're going right to the tissue and seeing that, but you wouldn't want to go in every three months and have a surgical lung biopsy. So, I mean, I, I just think that that's what they're trying to kind of weigh here, is that it may give you more information, but there are definite risks associated with it. So. And the tests are generally presented as part of the diagnostic studies that we use, but they really are used differently. We tend to use that CT scan to understand the pattern to make a diagnosis. But um, looking at how that changes over time, I don't, m most people don't have a great sense of what to do with that information. On top of that, the pulmonary function tests are really telling us what your lungs can do, which as Wendy said, which is after we make a diagnosis and we're deciding on therapy, that's really what we're most interested in, unless we're concerned that that pattern has changed or maybe there's something new going on, which would mean, which would require taking another look at the actual lung tissue um, or uh, pictures of the lung. Um, the breathing tests are often more of a, a useful clinical marker for us. So certainly, you have good days and you have bad days. You learn how to do the test and maybe it's going to improve the next time you take it. Right, exactly. And so we recognize that there's variation. And so generally what providers will tell you is we take, wait for there to be a pattern on those pulmonary function tests, right? We want to see that you've had at least, a, if there's a drop in your lung function, that it's a drop that we see over two consecutive tests. 
before we're really convinced of it because everybody's allowed to have a bad day. There's allowed to be variation, right? But it's over time looking at that pulmonary function test and we generally feel more comfortable about being able to offer that test on a regular basis. Then a CT scan where those findings may lag or even if there are findings, ones that we don't necessarily know what, how to clinically act upon. And I will say none of these tests, even the CT scan, are um, perfect. And so it's really a combination of all of these things, you, how you're feeling, how your symptoms are doing, what you're able to do compared to the last visit, your oxygen levels on six minutes. It's a combination of so many different pieces that we put together and we don't put any singular weight in a single test. It's the combination of all of these things in that conversation with your doctor that tells us how you're doing with your disease. Question at the back. Um, I was diagnosed two years ago, and I hesitate to tell other people because I know they're going to go to their device and look up ILD, and they're going to see life expectancy three to five years, and I don't want to scare them, and I'm basically ignoring that. But some on some you know on Facebook or whatever, some say that that's not that's no longer an accurate diagnosis, that that's outdated because it's from before the antifibrotics. And I'm just wondering from professionals, um, is that still what you would consider the average life expectancy after diagnosis or is that really outdated? I think your answer is one of those remains to be seen. So we have just hit the five year mark for the two, um, medicines that are approved to treat IPF. When I talk to patients right now who are newly diagnosed, yes, I give them those numbers, two to five years. I also tell them about the medicines that are approved. But right now, we don't have the data that says, if you take these medicines, your life will be longer. I can't say that right now. But there's lots of data being generated right now on all of you that are on these type of medicines to look and see if that could be happening in the real world setting. Um, so to answer the question, you know, from a professional standpoint, the data tells me right now that it's, we're still at that two to five year mark. You live your life and you live it loudly and beat it. That's what I encourage all of you to do, is to beat that. So, I mean, I would just comment too, as you said, the average is two to five years, that I guarantee you if you ask all the clinicians on this panel and all my visits, everybody will talk about that they have patients that have lived 10 years, 12 years, you know, and unfortunately, like I said, what we don't know right now is which patient will do that, and that's a right. lot of the things we're trying to understand. Of, you know, genetic markers, or, you know, other things that we can try to identify more appropriately what your course is going to be. But, um, you know, again, at, at two to five is, is average, and there are many people that live well beyond that. Right, so. and we, and just like at Dr. Lee's Center as well, we still have people that are doing well who were in those original trials. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not everybody is still with us, but I do still have people that come to see us regularly who were in those original trials, and it's always wonderful to see them in clinic. I have a question on, it goes back to some of the earlier questions on oxygen. Um, in hindsight, I've got IPF diagnosed about 18 months ago, but in hindsight, I, I think I had a lot longer ago from that. Uh, I traveled out to Colorado, got into elevation, had some issues there. Um, my question is, related to getting used, used to having low oxygen. For instance, I can function without being short of breath at 82, 83, 84, 85 percent saturation. I don't feel short of breath. I climb a uh, flight of stairs, carry something heavy, and I can drop to the high 70s without taking any supplemental oxygen, and I notice that. But if I'm at 85, 86, 87, 88, I don't feel shortness of breath. So. Um, I'm not reaching for my oxygen concentrator at those levels. So my question is, what is the cumulative effect of being desaturated to those levels below 90 but above 80, and how long or what sort of things could I be doing wrong by not being fully saturated? So Dr. Lee had talked about developing pulmonary hypertension. 
or you know, the possibility that you could develop pulmonary hypertension. And that's, that's the worst kind of thing that could happen is that you could have IPF and pulmonary hypertension. So the way I, I describe pulmonary hypertension happening to patients is you have these sensors in your body and these sensors can tell, even when you can't, that your oxygen levels are low. So you may not feel short of breath, but these sensors recognize it and they tell your brain, and your brain says, "Woo, I'm getting a little low on oxygen up here. I'm gonna tell the heart that he's gotta work harder, okay? So your resting heart rate's gonna get higher because your oxygen needs more, your brain needs more oxygen, okay? Your heart is a muscle. And what happens to any muscle that we work harder? What happens? It gets bigger, right? So your heart's having to bust it to work faster because it's pushing more blood through your lungs, trying to oxygenate that, not realizing that your lungs aren't doing the job. All right? So now your heart muscle is getting bigger, kind of like hypertension is the silent killer. Your heart muscle's getting bigger. Your heart muscle doesn't like to get bigger. It gets so big and it decides, I don't like this anymore, and it stops pumping as well. So then you start getting this backup of, of blood and fluids, and that's kind of how, you know, just to put it very simply, how pulmonary hypertension will develop. If you develop pulmonary hypertension with your IPF, many studies have shown that you will, um, your mortality or you will die earlier in your lung disease, your window for transplant is much shorter. So for people like you that don't recognize that dyspnea when their oxygen saturations get lower, I, my challenge to you is know when your oxygen saturations are going to be, get low and put your oxygen on before you do those things. I don't know if I have explained that yeah. well. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, you're right, you yeah. don't. You don't feel regular hypertension develop either. I was just going to say, it's very similar. Right? Yeah. So regular blood pressure or hypertension that we measure out here is the silent killer for a very good reason. Pulmonary hypertension is your other system in your body. You don't feel it develop either. The symptoms of that type of pulmonary or that type of high blood pressure are very similar to what you feel with depression and with your lung disease less endurance, more shortness of breath, and when it gets bad, you start feeling like, you know, the sea and the stars, the pre-syncope, and having problems. So we wanna try to keep that from developing, and one of the ways we can, we may never be able to keep it from developing, but one of the ways we know is managing your oxygen well. Try to always keep yourself in the 90s, and if you know that going out to get the mail is gonna cause your oxygen to drop into the 80s, even if you don't feel short of breath. Put your oxygen on. Don't allow yourself to say, well, if I walk slower, or well, it'll bump back up real quick, you're allowing yourself to do this all day. And doing that will cause you to develop um, pulmonary hypertension. What are the tests for pulmonary hypertension? An echocardiogram is a good start, but gold standard is a right heart cath. Who wants to go through that, right? And there's really not any good medicine that we can give you to help this. There's a lot of good medicines out there for pulmonary hypertension, but I don't know that we've yet to prove any one for the pulmonary hypertension caused by fibrotic lung disease. So the best thing you can do is do your best to prevent it, put your oxygen on, especially when you know that your activity is gonna drop your SATs. That I think, I mean, I'm gonna echo that 100%. Prevention of desaturation is key, regardless of symptom um, presence or absence. And it's that prevention that is the hardest thing, right? So I've had patients tell me, I just wear my oxygen for five minutes before I do my activity and I, I take off my oxygen. But that oxygen, it's use it or lose it. <laughs> so it's gone by the time you get to the mailbox and your oxygen levels are low again. So it's really prevention is critical, and we know from the sleep apnea literature, you know, when patients are sleeping at night, they have this cyclic up and down with um, their oxygen levels, and there are data to support cardiovascular comorbidities associated with that, short-term memory loss issues associated with that. So there's 
several consequences that we worry about with repeated oxygen desaturation, which is why we stress so much about it for our patients, because we don't want any of those complications to occur um, in addition to having IPF, right? So the take home is dyspnea you own, right? That's your, that's your symptom, that's your feeling. Hypoxemia is separate. That's your oxygen levels dropping below a safe level, and they can't, we shouldn't conflate the two, right? And so if your oxygen levels are low, you need your oxygen, regardless of whether or not you feel good. And that's so we have a question back here, and then we're just gonna have, yeah. Oh, it's over here? Sorry. We have a question over here, and then we're just gonna have time for one more question after that, so. Well, you just answered some of it anyway. So um, my question was about pulmonary rehab and also oxygen use. So you were saying that pulmonary rehab is really good for everyone, but it doesn't actually rehab your lungs. It's rehabbing the whole rest of your body, right? So what you're actually doing is supporting your lungs while you're doing rehab. So it, it and I guess that's what you were just saying to him too, that as long as you are uh, needing oxygen because you're going low in oxygen, you should just use it all the time, right? It's not going to create dependence. We're all addicted to oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> We're all addicted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, certainly, um, you know, there's no dependence of oxygen. You know, if you use two liters, it doesn't mean that next year you're going to need three liters just by virtue of the fact that you were on two liters last year. There's no um, physical dependency on oxygen. And, um, and, but, you know, if you feel better on the two liters and your oxygen saturations are at 95%, that's totally fine. But sometimes patients want to be liberated from their oxygen. And if their oxygen levels are 95% on room air, then you don't need to wear the oxygen. There's no benefit of having additional oxygen on top of that. So, you know, it's smart use of the oxygen. I'm sure they're going to go over a lot of these tips and tricks in the next couple days about mm -hmm. when you should use it, how frequently you should be checking your oxygen saturation, what type of system is best for you to deliver the oxygen that you need, what you need at home, how to travel. Oxygen is so complicated and so frustrating for patients and providers alike, and there's so much complexity associated with it, and, and each individual is so unique and different in a lot of different um, ways. And so the, hopefully a lot of the resources here at the PFF will help you identify strategies for living better with, with oxygen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, they definitely will go through similar things, but there, I mean, you could have, you could have an entire day on yes. <laughs> your oxygen, so this is great, thank you. Okay, and now the last question back here. I wanted to go back to the question, uh, discussion around the PFT, the pulmonary function test. Um, every time I do one of these, I've done 12 in two and a half years, it seems to be very different. I've had four different healthcare uh, systems, and each time I do it, it seems to be very different. It, it's administered differently. The first one I did, I had a screen monitor in front of me with six candles, which I was encouraged to blow out. I've had other ones where the technician is almost screaming at me to continue going, <laughs> going, going, going until my head feels like it's exploding. Um, given the fact that we use that as a trigger for HRCT and the radiation concerns that we may have with that, and maybe it's not a question, maybe it's a challenge, but is there any move to standardize that fundamental test that we are all dependent on? That's a great question. I'll just start by saying that we, we do, these tests are supposed to, are standardized, right? And there's a protocol to follow for doing them. But this is not uncommon, that your tests will vary from one center to another because different techs have different systems, different uh, institutions have different ways of doing it. And so generally what we recommend to avoid that is that you get the test done at the same place. Right? So that there is standardization in how the test is being performed for you. And if we, if you come to, for example, if you come to UCSF and we see a test that doesn't really, it shows you have really great lung function, but a CT scan that shows a lot of disease or vice versa, that may prompt us to repeat it to see whether or not we're concerned about the quality of the test that's done, done there. But generally the recommendation is that you get, go to the same place. So once we've established your baseline, we're comparing you to yourself in the same environment as opposed to you to yourself in a bunch of different conditions we can't control. Great.
thank you all so much. This has been such a great session. I really have learned a lot and really have enjoyed it. And thank you to all the people who asked questions and thank you for staying. And we look forward to seeing you for the rest of the conference. Yeah.